Awesome. So we'll lead into question number two, topic number two. And so Sue, with someone as productive as yourself, uh, it's key that you create good habits, learn how to stick to them. And so what's your advice on creating good habits and ensuring that you actually stick to them? Yeah. So when it comes to habits and goals, it's they kind of go hand in hand. So I'm going to talk a little bit about creating habits, talk about some tips that are going to be helpful for creating the habits and making sure that you stick to them. Um, and then kind of talk about how you can set your habits as well as setting goal setting, doing goal setting together, <laughs> hand in hand. So when it comes to habits, um, many people just want to change. So you might be able to think when I first said habits of like, oh my gosh, I want to stop biting my fingernails, or I want to get in a better habit of drinking more water, or I want to get in a better habit of going to sleep earlier. Those might have all popped into your mind. And I want you to write those down, first of all, so you know which habits you want to go after. Um, but you may want to change the way you look, the way you train, your knowledge, anything like that. Um, so with change comes that change in habit. So habit Habits are an extremely interesting thing. It's often stated that repetition causes habit formation. So you might see like, oh, it takes 21 days to form a habit or 33 days or 66. I've seen all of those numbers thrown around as far as habit creation. Um, but actually, there's a good chunk of research showing that while there is a connection or correlation uh, between habits and repetition, repetition doesn't inherently cause habits to form. It's emotion. Um, so if your brain associates a positive feeling, your brain takes notice. So that made me feel good. I want to do it again. Um, and that will help you to remember to do it again. And that will help you to form that habit. Now, while that all sounds sounds very good and dandy, you might think, well, if it was that easy and if I felt good doing it, then I would have a lot more habits under my belt. So you might say like, oh, I enjoy working out. It made me feel good, but I don't do it all the time. Or I know that I should drink more water or get more sleep, but I still don't do it all the time. Um, so that's where another part of this comes in. Um, and it comes down to the mistake of not celebrating yourself enough. So when you make a small mistake, you almost always feel bad about it. I know I am my absolute worst critic. Um, I could sit and just completely trash myself. And sometimes I have to have Alex reel me back in um, if I make a mistake because I will just feel awful about it because I expect perfection out of myself, which I, I basically am perfect. So I I, I should expect perfection out of myself, <laughs> but yeah, you go. You go. Uh, <laughs> when you accomplish a small goal, you almost never feel good about it. So it's something that um, there's a huge discrepancy there. When you do something small that's wrong, you beat yourself up about it. But when you do something small that's right, you just kind of move on. So we're very fast to punish ourselves um, for a bad performance, yet we're very slow to celebrate a good performance. So this can not only decrease our motivation, it also makes it much harder to achieve long-term goals because we just keep picking at ourselves. If you're like, I, another day where I didn't hit my water goal, and then that's going to add on to how you feel about yourself, and it's going to be very hard to pick that goal up. So getting back to that emotion standpoint, standpoint there was a study done by the Harvard Business School, um, and it showed that by tracking small achievements each day, workers had enhanced motivation. So that means by recording or celebrating our progress, it can boost your sense of confidence um, that can be levered towards those future larger successes. So that's that dopamine can be released in these instances, which can energize us and give us that feel-good emotion and not only be a feeling of reward or accomplishment, but it can also encourage you to take action and do what triggered that release of dopamine in the first place. So creating that addiction to progress. Um, so you might feel silly celebrating something small. I definitely do sometimes. Um, but the thing is, you're not celebrating because you made a huge achievement. It's not that, oh, I drank water before I drank coffee. I am the absolute best and everyone should bow down to me. It's more so that you're celebrating uh, because you were successfully changing your habits. And the big achievements that you actually want to reach, those will come as a result of those daily tiny actions in the right direction. So when it comes to um, finding a habit, one of my favorite things to do is to clump habits. Um, another way that I've heard it said is to kind of... Um, find what that trigger is for doing that habit. So I have clients that often will say that they have a hard time remembering to take their supplements. And that used to be Alex and I to a T. Um, and I would just go the whole day and be like, oh crap, I forgot to take all those supplements. Um, but I clumped it with a habit that I'm already doing. I'm already making breakfast each morning. And so whenever I make my breakfast and it's on the stove, that's when I pull out first a little bowl so that I'm not just like holding all of my supplements in my hand or I had a really bad habit of putting it in my pocket 
and then forgetting about it. And then I would go on out the, my, throughout my day and either wash them in my clothes, and I've ruined some clothes from that, um, or I would then reach into my pocket at night and be like, oh, there's everything I was supposed to take today. So uh, being able to have that in front of my face, because I know if it's sitting in front of me, I will much more likely to do it than if it's in my pocket because I get carried away. My brain's going in a million different directions. But it's also something that each time I'm cooking, I'm like, oh, wait, I haven't taken my supplements yet. I'm going to go ahead and find the small bowl, put everything into the bowl, and then move on um, and take those throughout my breakfast. So it's something that I was constantly forgetting, but being able to first not only solve a problem to holding it in my hand or putting it in my pocket or then rolling over the counter, but clumping it with a habit that I'm always going to do. So um, again, with the water and the coffee, if you might be like, oh, I always drink coffee before I have water, making sure as your coffee is brewing, as you put in the Nespresso pot, if you put in the K-cup, whatever it may be, that you're also filling up your water cup. And then as that's brewing, making it a habit of sitting there and drinking some water. So being able to clump your habits um, or find what that trigger is to remember that habit is going to be extremely helpful. Another one is just to be starting simple. Oftentimes people come to this point of like, I want to change everything in my life. And that's something with clients where they're like, I want to make this huge change. And it's like, that's awesome. But is doing a 180 degree change sustainable? And is it going to be something that you can actually implement? So instead, it's taking one step forward um, and putting one foot in front of the other. So not taking on too much. Um, And it's even something like, let's say you're like, I want to go to sleep earlier. And let's say you say you want to go to sleep two hours earlier. The first night you try going to sleep two hours earlier is going to be extremely difficult. It's going to feel like you are, I mean, grandma gearing up for bed, Um, but being able to start, okay, I'm going to start 30 minutes earlier tonight. All right. And two more nights, I'm going to do 30 minutes earlier than that. And then being able to get into that habit a little bit slower and a little bit simpler. So you're not taking on this huge task and eating this big chunk out of your day. Um, Another thing is being able to remind yourself. So being able to place uh, reminders throughout your house or wherever they may be, um, but also what the purpose of the habit was to begin with. So let's say it was drinking water. The purpose was to be able to feel better, to be able to hydrate yourself and be able to have better uh, reach towards your goals for your health and fitness um, aesthetics and your performance. Uh, So being able to remind yourself, it's not just, oh, I didn't get my water in today. It's I am putting myself in a place where I'm not reaching my overall goal. Um, And being able to have that as a reminder is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, Or even just having like a calendar and marking off each day. I'm someone who really thrives off of being able to like check things off a list. If I have like a whole list of things to do in a day and I don't get to check any of them off the list, my day kind of feels incomplete. Um, So making a list not only helps within doing the habit, but then it's also that reminder of like, oh, I got it done. And that's like a a small dopamine hit for me as I cross something off my checklist. Um, And then also being able to have a buddy is helpful, a buddy or a coach, someone to hold you accountable. And especially if your friend or buddy wants to be able to do that as well. So you can always text each other, hey, did you hit your water goal today? Did you make sure that you drank this much water throughout the day, whatever it may be. Um, And one really, really important one is to replace a lost need. So this is something where people go into a habit and they try to change their habit and then they don't replace what they're giving up. So let's say that you're, you want to stop watching TV, but watching TV was the only time during the day that you had to relax. Then you completely cut that out from you. And then that's going to be really hard to form that habit because you haven't replaced that need. Now it's not replacing one habit with a maybe less worse habit, but replacing the need of the habit. Um, So if you're taking away TV and TV was a time for you to wind down or zone out, how can you now do that? Is that through yoga? Is that through going on a walk and listening to a podcast? Is that through meditating? Whatever that may be, being able to replace what that need is. Um, And then when it comes to habits, knowing what the benefit is, which I kind of already talked about, but knowing what the pain is as far as if you don't reach that goal, what are the negatives for not reaching that goal? What are the consequences and the downsides of that? So those are just some things within habit formation when it comes down to it of being able to get 
in on your goals and what those are going to be. But a huge part within habits, which you might have already kind of gathered from me talking, is when it comes to being able to set things that are actually going to be attainable. So SMART goal setting, SMART in all caps, uh, is going to be very helpful for habit setting and goal setting. So when it comes to what SMART stands for, it's going to stand for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So when it comes to specific, making sure it's not just oh, I want to feel better because you can't really measure that on a metric. It's not specific. You don't know. And so then you get in this loop of never achieving your goals and always feeling like you're not achieving your goals, which is no fun. Um, So being able to kind of ask yourself, um, what exactly do I want to achieve? Where, how, when, with whom? What are the conditions? What are the limitations? Uh, What exactly do I want to reach this goal for? What are possible alternative ways of achieving the same thing? So it's not just, I want to look good. It's, I want to meal prep all of my meals for the next week on Sunday night to be successful for the upcoming uh, week to make sure that I feel good. So it's not just that one that's not specific and it's just, oh, I want to feel good because how are you going to know when you feel that way? Um, Another one is measurable, like I said. So making sure exactly, being able to identify exactly it is what you will see, hear, or feel when you do reach your goal and being happier is not evidence of that because you can't always measure happiness. So making sure that you have that measurable goal is going to be great for being able to measure it along the way and know that you're headed towards the right path. Um, It's the same thing with doing check-ins with a coach. You're taking time to measure how you're going about. Um, Keeping a logbook, you're taking time to measure how you're progressing within training. Um, Being able to have those measurable goals will make them actually something that you can reach because you can measure if you got there or not. Um, And that loops into attainable. And if it's something that is going to be a reality for you, um, if you weigh the effort, the time, the cost of the goal and what that looks like, and if it can be a priority in your life. Um, Also, if it is relevant. So the main thing you want to ask is why do you want to reach this goal and what's the objective behind this goal? And will this goal really achieve that objective? And then when it comes to being timely, um, one thing within being timely is if you're too stringent on that. Sometimes it can be very discouraging, but being able to set that goal of a checkpoint time, I think is a lot more realistic and a lot more motivating because it gives you that time to check in, see what you need to shift within your goals, um, and then be able to move forward. So when it comes to habit formation, uh, just to wrap up a few things that I said is just being able to realize that it is the emotion part of it as well as time and being consistent with it, but being able to have those different steps that I mentioned along the way can really help within getting those habits formed um, and not doing that all or nothing approach. So that's what I have as far as goal setting, habit formation, um, and what that looks like. So either of you guys can take it away for what else you want to add. I know I talked a lot and fast, but (laughs) that'll be a No, it's great. (laughs) That's great. I'll I'll go really quick. Um, So a lot of great points made there. Uh, I just want to kind of touch on a few of them that you, a few of them that have been really important for me. Um, kind of over the years of just creating better habits. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the, uh, the kingpin of, of great overall, like efficiency of life. Um, but I also don't think it's, I think it's important that we don't get too caught up in sort of judging our best self on the amount we accomplished each day or how productive we were or, or whatever else. Right. So, um, that's just kind of my, my own thing um, and, and really managing your expectations there uh, and just setting things up kind of from the jump a little bit better um, to kind of better achieve those things. But the first thing I wanted to mention that's been really, really helpful for me um, kind of in the, the camp of managing expectations is success lies in the metrics you're tracking, right? So this is kind of that those smart goals. Um, if we're going towards a certain thing yet you're grading yourself on something else, how do you expect yourself to get there? Um, how, how is that a fair assessment of what you've been working on, right? So understand success lies in the metrics you're tracking. So you need to set those metrics. And that's kind of what Sue was talking about with SMART goals. We need to create something that is smart. We need to create intelligent goals. We need to create, um, we need to create timely goals, things we can manage and assess over time, right? Um, another thing that has really helped me out is association triggers. So I know, um, like I can't, I can't eat and lounge in bed 
because by the time it goes, it's time to go to bed, I will now associate that with lounging or eating or whatever else. And now um, I'll have trouble going to sleep. Same like with my work day. Um, so working on like professional goals. I know when I get to my desk, uh, I have a certain place I put my phone. And the first thing I do is now that I have my standing desk, hallelujah, I basically raise up my standing desk first thing in the morning, I put my phone uh, in the place it goes. And I'm often running into email. And so it's those association triggers. And I know once I take steps away from my desk or I take like a work break or um, I know I this is my time to like post on social media or, hey, here's five minutes to kind of catch up with DMs or just sort of, I hate to say reward yourself with social media, but I mean, hey, if you enjoy and you, I think if you cultivate it and enjoy, um, enjoyful, that's not a word. Um, if you've created and sort of cultivated this really, really cool community within social media and you follow people, you really enjoy looking at their content, you learn a lot, it's a good experience. Who's to say that's a negative thing, right? So, um, you know, a lot of, for me, that's, that's how I'm, keep up with friends or that's how I keep up with certain things happening within the industry or within a certain, um, a certain space. And I learn a lot. So making sure those association triggers are in check, um, and understanding that those things happen. And some I think are more sensitive than others. I'm someone who's very sensitive with association. Um, and so I very much have those cues and triggers that I have to sort of watch out for. Um, the next one, uh, is, self-compassion. How would you treat a friend in the same situation? That's how you should be treating yourself in this, in this situation. And I, this has been something that's really, um, I've had conversations with clients in the, in the past, and this is something that I think we all could improve upon, right? So if you're dealing with something and if let's say you're just struggling with that thing or that situation, imagine yourself having a friend, a close friend, or just anyone come to you and tell you the exact same situation that you're in right now, how would you address that? How would you handle that? How would you speak to that friend, right? You'd probably give them more compassion than you're giving yourself. You would not be as hard on your friend as you are being on yourself, right? And there's a lot of, if you really sort of address that in that manner, you sort of can, you almost steel man the argument in a way where you are seeing the holes within your own argument and making that essentially making that stronger for yourself, which then is going to help you more easily deal with that pain, deal with that stress or deal with that sort of acute anxiety, right? So anxiety isn't acute anxiety. It just is a, is a marker. It's a trigger. It's telling us something is wrong, right? Um, now not addressing that issue, not addressing that anxiety can prolong that and now it becomes chronic now because something that we're dealing with day in and day out because we haven't addressed it, right? We haven't properly dealt with it. Um, and so I think in, in large part, a lot of these, especially for me through experience, can get better with self-compassion and treating yourself as if your friend was going through it. How would you give them advice? Um, and at the end of the day, I think we'd all be better off if we listened to our own advice. So. That's where I want to end now. And Alex, what do you got? I will just add one more in the sense that uh, with like to-do list or, or task list within habits, um, I am someone who has all of the confidence in the world that I'm going to crush the world after about my first three or four sips of coffee. I have, I've, I've had a good night of sleep. I'm up very early and it's like, okay, well, this to-do list is going to be about 18 things long. And two o'clock hits and I've got about six things done and I'm tired and there's, and then I'm looking at the day as kind of a failure. Thus, I encourage you to uh, set realistic goals within your, your day-to-day -day task to ensure that you're not just leaving yourself feeling empty handed at the end of the day, because you didn't finish this post-it note that has a million things scribbled on it, that it was impossible to even get done in the, the time awake, let alone maybe in a week time. Uh, so that would be the, the one thing I'll add there. Yeah. And talking about that realistic thing, um, as far as like how many tasks you can get done in a day, uh, I was just talking about this to someone the other day, as far as timing yourself to tasks. So, you know, what's truly attainable because I 
used to be the person that would put a million things on my task list. And every day I'd be like, man, I suck. Like this is not getting done. Um, and then Alex went through a period of time where he was like, I'm, I just, I'm not being productive. I'm lazy. And I'm like, you've been working all day. What do you mean you're lazy? Um, and he'd be like, I still have this to get done. I was like, well, did you time yourself doing these tasks? Cause I, I recently did that. So I'm feeling like I can give advice on it. Um, did you time yourself and how long it took you to do that? And then it was like, oh wait, that's not realistic. I'm setting myself up for failure each day, thinking that I can uh, do these things. Um, and then getting very beat down and feeling like I'm not reaching my goals. And then it gets into this negative feedback loop. So that's even something with clients. Like if clients are leaving each day, maybe they didn't hit their macros on the head, then they get into this negative feedback loop of, man, I suck. I'm not hitting my goals. And so it's being able to set them up. All right. How can we make it so that you're hitting your goals? Or how can we make your goals a little bit easier or more attainable for you to hit so that you can go into the night feeling good about yourself and wake up each morning knowing that you're going to crush everything that you have laid out for the day.